Uh, so I've really enjoyed this, uh, this weekend with you so far. I had a great day yesterday with those who were able to come along to the church conference thinking about vision and where the future of the church may be, where God is leading us next. And uh, this morning, I've just called what I want to say, Church with a Vision. And I want to talk about the importance of owning together a vision that you believe God has given you. Going and uh, continuing a process, I suppose, we began yesterday of saying, where is God leading us? How can we be committed to moving on into his future? And um, our key Bible reading for this is Luke chapter 4, beginning of verse 14. This is when Jesus begins his public ministry in his hometown of Nazareth, and he visits the synagogue, and this is what happens. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in the synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went up to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and a recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's name. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. It seems to me that everyone who's brought about transformation in the world has had a vision. William Wilberforce. Remember this guy? In 1789, he stood before uh, the, uh, the UK Parliament in London and he made a cry for a day when men and women and children would not be sold and bought like cattle or animals. He said we have got to end the slave trade across the British Empire. And uh, it was shouted down. And he got nowhere. What happened? Did he give up? No. Every year for the next 19 years, he brought that plea in a bill to Parliament. And finally, in 1807, Parliament passed a law ending the slave trade. And in fact, in the following years, he said, we've got to end slavery altogether. And just four days before he died in 1833, a law was passed ending slavery. Why did that happen? Because he had a vision. He wasn't happy with the status quo, the way things were. And he saw a different future. A future where people from Africa were not bought and sold and used as slaves in the British Empire. And that vision empowered him to bring transformation. Let's think of some other people. Florence Nightingale, you know the story, I guess. So she goes out to the Crimean War to work in a hospital. The conditions there are horrific. It's filthy, it's dirty, there are untrained staff, no one seems to know what they're doing. Infection is rife in the hospital. Does she say, oh, well, that's what nursing's like? No, she has a vision for something better. She says, wouldn't it be great if nurses were properly trained? Wouldn't it be great if we learned about hygiene and, if, and, and, um, and just washing our hands before we uh, deal with patients and keeping things clean and, uh, and re uh, reducing the amount of infection? And she came back to Britain and she set up a nursing training college at St. Thomas's in London <coughs> and... Uh, uh, it, over the next 15, 20 years, the whole of the nursing profession became, well, became professionalized for the first time. She saw a better future. She had a vision for a different way of doing things. Your, uh, well, sort of near, near neighbor one time, Andrew Carnegie from Dunfermline, you know the story, as a young man, he was in quite a poor family in Dunfermline, <coughs> but they loved books. And his family exposed him to a lot of reading when he was young. They emigrated to the States, cutting a long story short, he became ridiculously rich in, uh, through, um, uh, through um, working uh, in the steel industry and owning steel companies. 
And in his later years, when he sold his, uh, his share in, uh, or his ownership of the steel companies when he was 64, <coughs> and gave his life to philanthropy, he said, I'm going to spend as much money as I can on setting up libraries. Because he had a vision that other people would have the privilege of reading, as he had done in his childhood and throughout his life. And through giving away his money, over 3,000 libraries were established around the world. Because he had a vision of how things could be different. Here are the Wright brothers. In the uh, late 1800s, they announced that the age of the flying machine had come. And people laughed because they knew you could travel over the land and you could travel through the sea. But no one was going to travel through the air. But they kept trying to build uh, flying machines and they kept not working until 1903, when finally they got, they, they, they did this trial, was it, Kitty Hawk on, on, on the beach in Kentucky, and this plane took off, and it was the first uh, human flight in a powered flying machine like that. They held on to a vision that things could be different, that they didn't have to be as they always had been. And perhaps above all, when we think of vision, we think of this man, Martin Luther King, who was part of a, a situation in America where black people were absolutely second class citizens or worse. Where there was not only a prejudice, but a discrimination that, uh, that, that ruined the lives of so many and that segregated the country. And he said, I put it there, I have a dream that one day on the Red Hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. He met fierce opposition, as you know, but he persevered. And people gathered around that vision with him, and he wouldn't let go of it. And uh, you'll have seen maybe films like Selma that have come out recently that just tell the story of how that, that, that vision galvanized people to action and eventually there were changes in the law that brought in an equality in law for black and white. You see, a vision is a picture of the future that produces passion. A picture that produces passion. And everyone who has brought about transformation has had a vision. Uh, they, they've seen a different future. And uh, I think that as the Church of Jesus Christ, we are all about transformation. Has Jesus transformed your life? Of course he has. You can't have a living relationship with Jesus Christ without you being transformed. If anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation. Your relationship with God has been transformed. Your attitudes have been transformed. Your love for others has been transformed. Your ability to forgive others has been transformed. Your hope and belief about what's important in life has been transformed. Because that's what happens when Jesus Christ takes hold of our life. We are all about transformation. And not only that, but there's a greater transformation to come, isn't there? We were singing before, what was it, when Christ shall come with shout of acclamation. We believe not only that God has begun changing us now, but there will one day be a new heavens and a new earth. Our lowly bodies will be transformed into the likeness of Jesus' resurrection body. The one who first made all things will finally make all things new. We, the church of Jesus Christ, are a movement caught up in God's transformation. And so every church of Jesus followers will surely have a vision for transformation. Again, we were singing one with build your kingdom here. Isn't that a, a, a vision for transformation? We're not happy with things just being the way they are in this world. It's not enough to say, oh, that's how it is. We have a vision of a better future. To be a church where lost people are found. To be a church where broken people are healed, where failures are forgiven, where searching people find purpose, where rejected people find a family, where isolated people find community, where hopeless people find hope, and where dying people find eternal life. Isn't that 
Our mission, are you, are you kind of generally in agreement with me on that? Yeah, good, thank you for those who nodded slightly there. We need a vision burning within us if we are to be a church that is transformed and transforming. If we are to make a difference in a broken world. If we are to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And really, I want to urge and encourage you to have a clear vision as a church. To know not only where you are now, but where you want to be. What you believe God could do through this group of believers that is in the Kingdom Baptist Church. So if someone asks, why are you here? You can give a clear answer. So if someone asks, what's the church trying to do? You can give a clear answer. Now, we read from Luke chapter 4, where Jesus sets out his vision at the beginning of his ministry. Let me read it again. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, he says, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Let's just notice something about Jesus' vision. Because it might help us in understanding the kind of vision God wants us to have. And the first thing to say is that it's scripture based. Do you recognize those words that Jesus speaks? They are taken from the book of Isaiah. From Isaiah chapter 61. So when Jesus comes, he doesn't say, listen everyone, I've made up this idea. I've just been thinking on my own and I think this would be a really good idea to do. He doesn't say, oh, I heard about someone in Syria and they're doing something really interesting and I'd like to, to copy that and try to... Jesus in his childhood and his youth has been soaked in the scriptures. He's read them, he's, taught, he's been taught them, he's learned them in the synagogue, he's learned them from the rabbis. And as he understands and expresses what it is for him to be the unique son of God, he explains it in terms of the scriptures. He says, look, this is the story that God's given us over centuries. And what I'm doing is based on that. I am the fulfillment of what Isaiah spoke about. The one who would come and preach good news to the poor. This is a scripture-based vision. Secondly, it's a servant-hearted vision. Do you notice that? When the Son of God comes into the world, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, he doesn't say... I've, um, I've, I've made friends with some of, the, uh, some of the kings and emperors around here. Uh, I've, uh, I've, I've, I've sorted things out with, uh, with uh, the Roman emperor, with Caesar. And I'm going to sit around in the, t in, the, uh, in the palaces. I'm going to eat the best of food. I'm going to live in luxury. And I'm frankly going to take it easy while the other people do the work and get involved in the mess of the world. That's not what happens when Jesus, the Son of God, comes into the world. His vision is to be servant-hearted. To proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. He is going to be there with the people in greatest need. Because God is love and those who live in love live in God and he lives in them. Because when people's lives are infused by the power and presence of God, that love overflows to people in need and in desperation. So this is a servant-hearted vision. It's also a salvation vision. Focus vision. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And right, you can see it in Mark chapter 1, at the beginning of Jesus' uh, uh, travels from village to village. He says, this is my message, the, the uh, repent and believe the good news. The good news is the good news of the Father's love that is shown in Jesus Christ and will be shown supremely in his death and then his resurrection. So this is salvation focused. Jesus is saying, I'm going to call people to a saving experience of God. I'm going to proclaim good news that people can believe, they can receive by faith and it will put them right with God. And the other thing is it's a spirit-empowered Vision. He says at the beginning, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me. He's not saying, here's something that anyone could do if they just put their mind to it. He's not saying, with willpower, you can achieve anything. 
He's saying, here's something, that only if the power of Almighty God flows into me, I will be able to do. And of course, those around him, or many of them, know that he's just not long before of being baptized by John the Baptist. And as he came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit came down on him like a dove. And a voice spoke from heaven saying, this is my son whom I love. In him I am well pleased. They knew that he was spirit empowered. Now, let's leave that on the screen for a minute. Because surely our vision as a church should reflect these things as well. We need a scripture based vision. Our vision could be based on the past. Our vision could be to continue doing what we've always done. To continue Sunday worship as we've always done it. Oh, and we've always done tea and coffee after Sunday worship, so we need to continue doing that. And we've always done pastoral visiting, and we've always looked after the building. So our vision is no more than continuing the status quo. Now, those things may all be good things. I'm not, um, not knocking at any of them. But a vision from God starts by saying, what does the scripture say? It doesn't really mention the tea and coffee so much. But it's, Jesus says, come and follow me, and I'll send you out to fish for people. The scripture says, love one another as I have loved you. Look after the widows and orphans. Preach the gospel in season and out of season. And the church's vision arises from these big pictures in scripture of what happens when God gets to work. As churches, we need a servant-hearted vision. Jesus came as a servant. He revealed God's compassion to people in need. He didn't say to his disciples, listen folks, form a nice club and look after one another. Gradually let people in, in ones and twos. If they look like they'll fit in with you. Actually, Jesus seems to be surrounded by misfits so often. Seems to be surrounded by people who were marginalized. It seemed a bit messy around Jesus uh, a, lot, um, a lot of the time with, you know, people, you know, one month saying, well, here you are, you're a friend of sinners and prostitutes and uh, tax collectors and drunkards. And Jesus saying, well, actually, these are the people who need the kingdom of God. A church needs a servant-hearted vision, looking out for the left arts, the isolated, the marginalized. Because that's where the Father's love most needs to be seen. And the genius of the church down the ages, when we have been in step with God's spirit, when we've had a God-given vision, is the church in society has been the leader in feeding the hungry, in providing shelter for the homeless, in initiating hospi hospitals, and more recently hospices, in care of refugees, in developing food banks, in street pastors in our nighttime economies in towns and cities around the country. When we have a servant-hearted vision, when we say, where are the people in need and what are we doing or what could we do to bring the blessing of God's love and the message of good news to them, then we are in the right place. You know, one of the things that's mattered to me a lot over the last couple of years, I haven't told you much about my life. Um, I did say a bit to the people before, but... Uh, for, um, in, in August last year, I came to join the Baptist Union of Scotland um, to, to work as the Ministry Development Coordinator. We've got about 170 churches in our network, the Baptist Union around the country, as probably you know, and I've got a particular responsibility for the ministers within our network. But um, before that, I'd spent 19 years leading a church in Worcester, down, down in England, just a little south of Birmingham. And uh, the church had grown quite a bit during that time, and uh, <coughs> good things, God had blessed us quite richly. And uh, um, one thing we developed was, um, which really had been, uh, been um, something that was my initiative, most things in the church weren't my initiative, because you know, all the best ideas come from places other than the minister uh, very often. I said that with all humility rocks, but that's what happened to me. I, I didn't have many good ideas. But we set up something called Open Space, which was a group it was, a, it was on a Tuesday morning, and it was a worship service for people with profound learning, uh, learning difficulties. And uh, their carers would come along with them, and we have <clears throat> half an hour or, um, or so um, of worship service with songs and with activities and with a, with a simple message and with prayers, and they be very interactive. And it was a glorious time in my week to meet with people who were 
not only often kind of forgotten and marginalised and distanced in society, but a group of people who the church was, wasn't very good at including either. And we had this great time, and I just made some lovely friends of uh, people with learning difficulties who I, I wouldn't have known before. And my friendships were so different with them because the level of communication was, was pretty low. And that became a really important part of my life. And uh, a couple of times, um, the leadership team in the church said, we're not really sure if it's very sensible for you to be giving so much time to this group, Martin, because the church was about 500 people, so I tended to get caught up in all kinds of other things. But I just wouldn't heed that advice to let go of, um, of, of open space. Because for me, it was really important that there was something very servant-hearted that I was involved in week by week and month by month with, uh, with a group of people in the church. And I just felt you know, something of a God-given vision to pursue that and to continue that. We had a team, it wasn't just me doing it, there were a team doing it, but I continued to lead that team um, and put other responsibilities aside to make the time to do that on a Tuesday. Um, and, and church's vision also needs to be salvation focused. Are you doing all right, by the way? I'm, you, 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 I'm not boring you to death. You're up to speed about this. Okay, so we're on the third thing. Okay, so a church's vision needs to be salvation focused. We have the words of eternal life. Jesus has given, given them to us. Jesus is the saviour of the world. And we've got a message that everyone who confesses with their lips that Jesus is Lord and believes in the heart that God raised him from the dead will be saved. Now, on the whole, it seems we find it easier to do good deeds than to speak about salvation. Yet showing someone the way to eternal life is surely the ultimate good deed. And the church's vision needs to be salvation focused. Not only how can we serve people in need, that is important, but how can we lead people towards salvation in Jesus Christ. A healthy church has both serving ministries and saving ministries. I was telling the, the folk yesterday that in in, in the church that, that I was leading until, until last summer. We ran an alpha course every term in the year, and we had done for 18 years. Um, sometimes loads of people came on the alpha course, sometimes a tiny number of people did. But we felt it was important that we got a course that would introduce people to personal faith in Jesus Christ running all the time. So the, there was always a sense that you know, if someone was interested, if we had a friend we wanted to bring along, if someone arrived at church under their own steam wanted to find out more about Jesus, they would soon be starting the next course when they could find out about the salvation because that was one of the most helpful ways we had of doing that. And I was talking with the people yesterday as well about the importance of having a culture of invitation. You know, it's, uh, it's great if people can, you know, people will self-select to come to our coffee shop or our parent and toddler group or other activities we're doing. But not many people that are not already believers choose to come to church on Sunday. And yet here, you've got Ross or whoever speaking and explaining the words of eternal life week by week. You've got the enthusiasm of people worshipping together with these great worship songs that say so much and express so much of our faith. And, you know, if we saw some people coming into this environment, surely some of them would hear and understand from us and from our life together that message of salvation. I said to the folk yesterday, how difficult is it to say, would you like to come to church with me? It's nine words that could really change someone's life. Would you like to come to church with me? And the fourth thing about vision is it needs to be spirit empowered. Jesus' mission could only be fulfilled by the power of the spirit. It was beyond human accomplishment. And it seems to me that a local church vision should look impossible apart from the power of God. If we come up with a vision that we can accomplish in our own strength, it's a failure of faith and courage. If we say, well, our vision is to do what we're already capable of, that's no vision at all, really, and it doesn't require the Spirit of God. It's been said many times over the years, hasn't it, um, of, of churches, you know, if the Holy Spirit was taken out of this church, what would be different? And it's a, it's a challenging question that I've come back to again and again. 
and I think we all need to do. If the Holy Spirit was taken, what are the things we are doing that are only possible because of the power of the Holy Spirit? And what would it take for in the Keeling Baptist Church to have a vision arising from audacious faith? I don't know what you might say. You might say, our vision is, amongst other things, to serve 30 of the neediest people in this town in somewhere or another. Or a vision that said, we want to be a place where someone is saved every month. I'm pretty sure you can only do that by the power of God's Spirit. We want to be a church where everyone is trained to share their faith with others. It would take the power of the Spirit to do that. We want to become a community of trust where anyone is welcome. It would take the power of the Spirit to break down our natural prejudices and hesitations about people who are different from us. We need a vision, like Jesus, that can only be accomplished in the power of the Spirit. A vision is a picture of the future that produces passion. And uh, the great thing about a vision is that um, and it keeps us focused. It reminds us what our priority is. Because the difficulty is that we fall into maintenance mode. Just keeping things going as they have done. And we give all our energy to that. There's um, some great words here in uh, Mark 1. Um, Jesus, um, um, Jesus has had a very fruitful time preaching in some of the villages in Galilee. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. Jesus knew why he had come and it was to preach good news to the poor. So he had a fruitful time in a village the day before and the people are all saying, oh, geez, get Jesus to come back. We want, we want his autograph or at least we want him to do some more healing here. Or we want to hear some more of those incredible stories and teachings that he brings. But Jesus says, my vision is to preach good news to the poor in all these villages. I'm not going to go back and keep doing the same thing in the same place. Because I know my vision. And I need to find the poor wherever they are. The poor in spirit and the poor materially. And preach this message to them. That is why I'm here. And every church needs to be able to say, and this is why we're here. We know the things. We know our vision is the things that drive us. That are our priorities, because they also give us energy. Um, no saint, but Steve Jobs, who, uh, you know, said, uh, Apple died a few years ago, sadly, said, if you're working on something ex exciting that you really care about, you don't have to be pushed. The vision pulls you. You get drawn into what's good. If you really believe in the vision, whether you're Martin Luther King or Florence Nightingale or Andrew Carnegie or in the Keeling Baptist Church, if you have a vision, that creates energy and pulls you along. It strikes me, you know, Jesus says um, to his disciples, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. And uh, that is, uh, that is um, again, a, a point at which Jesus says, look, my vision is your vision. My mission is your mission. How did Jesus send the Father? He sent him in a body. And similarly, we are the body of Christ. The church together needs to do the mission of Jesus. Jesus was sent, as we've said, filled with the Spirit. And he came with a purpose. Jesus says to his disciples, says to us, as the Father sent me, so I am sending you. So, just as I finish, I believe there is a miracle that can happen. A miracle of transformation. I've discovered this weekend that can I call you IBC? IBC is a great church with great people and great ideas and great stuff you're doing already. So much that's good and treasured. But my conviction is that God has more for you. He's not finished with you yet. In fact, it may be that he's hardly started. God wants to give you a vision to be fruitful in new and wonderful ways for his kingdom. And will you settle for more of the same? Or will you extend yourselves towards his will? 
You might feel that it's all too much. We can't face a vision that extends us. We're already at capacity. But here's the thing. God's power, says the Apostle Paul, is made perfect in our weakness. It's when we dare to do something different, when we dare to take a risk, when we dare to face a challenge head on, that God's power is released in us. Jesus had been teaching the crowds all day, and they were hungry, and the disciples said, we need to feed them, and they checked out what was available, and there was a one boy who'd got five loaves and two fish with them. It was way beyond their capacity. <laughs> they, five loaves and two fish don't feed 5,000 people. Jesus said, let's start with what we've got and see what it takes us. Go and share the food with the people. And so they do. And 5,000 people are fed with what seemed like far too little. They didn't have the capacity to do this, except that God was at work somehow. And I asked myself, when did the miracle happen? Was it that the boy brought five loaves and two fish, and Jesus said, okay, when the big miracle, masses of food arises? No, it wasn't, was it? It was actually when they took the risk of handing it out that the miracle happened, not before. It was the same at, in the wedding at Cana. You know, they ran out of wine. Jesus says, well, fill the big jars with water and then take some out, pour it out, and give it to the master of the feast. And it turns out to be the most exquisite wine. They were beyond their capacity. They'd run out of wine. At what point does the miracle happen? When they pour out what they thought was water in the jars. It's when they pour it out. And it'll be when, in the Keeling Baptist Church, pours itself out more and more for the needs of people in your town and beyond, that the power of God will be released. Jesus had a vision fulfilled in the power of the Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord is on in the Keeling Baptist Church. And God is inviting you to extend yourselves and find and own a vision that is scripture-based, servant-hearted, <coughs> salvation-focused, and spirit-empowered. Is there any reason that we would say no to that? To become transformed people, bringing a foretaste of God's transformation to his world. May God grant you a big and rich vision for all he can and will do in you and through you.